Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Smart Grid Seminar. Our speaker today is Dr. Nina Perkins. She's from the City of Palo Alto Utilities. She's helped to cover about the decarbonization today. Uh, let me remind you that these are the presentations of this quarter. Uh, we recorded all the presentations, so if you need to review any of them, you can send us an email. And we'll send you the link. Dr. Dina Perkins is a sample graduate person. And she received her PhD in mechanical engineering. Uh, I believe it's uh, 2015 or 14, yeah. Uh, she has worked on microgrid projects in Alaska and American Samoa before joining the city of Baldwin. She is currently the manager of the Program for Emerging Technologies at City of Powerful Utilities. She also manages and optimizes the largest electric contract for the utility. This is a hydroelectric contract which provides about 45% of the electricity to the City of Powerful. Okay, uh, let's welcome our speaker. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I understand there's a variety of backgrounds and levels of expertise um, here and um, those participating remotely, so um, it'll probably flow a little better if you jot down questions um, as you go, because all my interesting slides are at the end. So the first step is just kind of intro and background. But so anything that you don't know the acronym for, or you're confused, all the slides should be numbered, should be numbered. Um, and so I'll just jump into it. And, can you remind me about how long you want me to talk versus Q&A? Um, most of the time, we talk about 45 minutes. Um, okay. So it's I get 35 now, okay. and this should end by around 2.30. Okay. Yeah. So I'll try to reserve most of it for Q&A, because uh, I think that's more interesting. Welcome. So City of Palo Alto Utilities is a municipal utility. There are six. Six utilities, six utilities, water, wastewater, electric, gas, storm drain, and fiber. Um, I work predominantly with the electric utility. Um, it's really interesting to be at a municipal utility that's both electric and gas, given that the big push nationally, globally, and certainly in California is to transition essentially all natural gas end uses to electric. So the idea is to wind down all of the natural gas infrastructure and essentially have no natural gas utility anymore. So, um, so that is, it's a really interesting time um, from that perspective and the electricity markets, as you might have noticed with the rolling brownouts the last um, couple of years, I guess. August 2020 was when we really had one, but we came really close this last, um, was last summer and and that speaks to a lot of structural changes going on. We can get into that. It's, it is um, interesting things are not always, not always fun when they happen on your spouse's birthday or other things like that. This is from Bloomberg 2020. And what it represents is that out of 850 cities around the world of various sizes, um, Palo Alto, the city of Palo Alto is leading in the actual achievement of its sustainability goal, which is an 80% reduction in carbon emissions from 1990 levels by 2030. So not what the goal was set at, but the actual progress towards the goal, um, which is great, which is really cool. And, it, and I can speak more about that. Um, you know, but it it also you know speaks to how a lot of the low hanging fruit is the easiest stuff to get to and to make bigger emissions reductions. We have to do still um, a lot more work. Um, so this this is from 1990 to today, um, 2018, but pretty close to this in 2021. Um, Essentially, the way the progress to date for emissions reduction has been to um, only have long term contracts for zero carbon electricity and then to purchase offsets for the natural gas. Um, 
And, you know, some work on, we had, there's, there's some other things around the edges, but, but that's basically where the progress has come from to date. And as you can see, the red bars, the one thing I want to draw your attention to, you can't read the typing is not so important, but the green was power emissions. We took those away. The blue is natural gas emissions. If you believe in offsets, then we have taken those out of the picture. And then the red is transportation and transportation is, it's coming. Um, it's, it's tricky, but it's coming. Um, so utilities have many levers to try to help lower CO2 emissions. And of course, staff isn't out there deciding what Palo Alto is going to do. The community of Palo Alto has to do that and they're doing it via their elected officials. So the, um, the um, city council of Palo Alto is actually our board of directors. And so you have laymen, smart laymen making really transformative energy decisions. That's really, it's interesting. Um, but at the same time, they're very connected to the constituency. It's really different than um, pg e you know, which has you know, moderate connection to the community. So you have rates, how those are structured, incentive programs, city mandates, um, where we source our, our energy and water, and then some pilots. Um, we have 100% carbon-free electricity, with 30% lower rates than within PG&E, 100% um, carbon neutral natural gas. That's the offsets. That's with carbon neutral. You could say carbon offset natural gas. Um, all electric mandate for new residences. So you must design a new home with only electric, um, no natural gas. Efficiency programs. Palo Alto is not a high growth city, so every year the efficiency programs run by our utility have the equivalent of removing 800 homes from the city in terms of efficiency gains. It's really aggressive for a, a low growth city. Highest EV adoption in the nation, 30% of new vehicles, 2.5% um, of electricity from N-City solar, and we're swapping in gas and water space, gas, space heaters and water, and gas water heaters for new electric heat pump space and water heaters. So. Heat pumps are like refrigerators, but you care about the heat side of it instead of the cooling side of it. So you just basically run a refrigerator backwards. Um, this is all great. Um, and it's only gotten us half of the way to this, um, you know, a little more than half of the way to our 80% um, reduction by 2030, which, you know, if you've been watching the news, is actually not enough even if it were accomplished on a global scale to kind of alleviate where we're going with global warming. So what are we gonna do with this more? Um, there's a 2020 action, climate action plan, you know, all of these things, um, these are all different areas. And so we, we have stuff there and now I'm getting to the interesting part. You know, of course we want a marginal weighted carbon curve um, and that's just basically where does your money go the farthest? If you care about chipping away at carbon, you know, get the low hanging fruit or low hanging fruit first. But the problem with some of those curves is that they misunderstand people's resistance or or legal matters or other things like that. So these are really interesting, but you know, and it takes a lot of work. You know, I think the key research questions are really rate structures. Um, there's a ton of, um, you know, rate structures are sending the signal to customers of what you want them to do. And everything about our supply and our transmission and our demand is different now. So these legacy rate structures that are, um, you know, litigated things that are very tightly constrained um, and what you can do and what you can't do, you know, these have to be adjusted. So, and I'll, I'll talk more about it later. This is kind of an overview of what we're gonna get into the interesting stuff. Um, how to wind down a natural gas utility um, equitably. So you could do things like pruning where you prune back from kind of the least, uh, least profitable areas, piecemeal where you electrify one appliance at a time, 
You can have natural gas fans. You can have renewable natural gas. Um, this is a really interesting area, and I'm, I'm hoping that somebody here wants to do, is in another class or wants to do an independent study on some of these areas, because it's a really data-rich, dynamic time, and we don't have time to do even 10% of the analysis that I think is out there. Um, so smart panels basically have smart circuit breakers in them, and you can connect different appliances, and you can do some interesting things, like throttle them or um, use them for shaping demand for reliability purposes, which is very valuable these days. Um, and, and also if we're going all electric, we as a community, we would be removing one of the energy services from people's homes. And people have a natural aversion to that. I understand, I'm an engineer. <laughs> we have infrastructure there. I have two sources of energy. Why would I give up one of them? But natural gas is a very, very hard thing to decarbonize, like as the methane molecule. So that's, you know, elect electrifying everything really is the cheapest path. So this is on rate structures. Everything about supply, transmission, and demand has changed. What that means is that often the marginal marginal resource that's um, the last electricity resource to be picked up is free because it's um, curtailed renewables that we have surplus because they're inflexible. And the whole rate structure was designed for that to be a really, really expensive gas peaker plant. What do you do with that? You know, like that legacy rate structure. So that's where like tiered rate structures come from. Um, okay, you know, and then, and it's very, it's a jumpy signal, you know, it's free and then it's expensive, it's free and then it's expensive. Um, what that means, you know, in combination with having to harden transmission because of wildfires and extreme wind events and extreme dry wind events, um, along with solar and other things is that if you actually pass through the true cost of the system right now, you're gonna end up gouging the poorest, least sophisticated customers. And while that's physical, is it fair? Is it equitable? The people that can't shape their demand and don't have a smart control panel and don't have solar and don't have a smart EV that can basically game the grid you know, should they, should they be paying a really high fixed cost because that's the true cost of the system. It's all in the wires. It's not in the generation anymore, right? That's a really hard thing to grapple with. And we basically need really cheap smart devices <laughs> to like, it would be one way to fix it because right now like the whole rate structure is upside down. It doesn't represent reality. And it's, it's a very careful stepwise thing to try to to try to answer these questions, you know, and then if we electrify everything, but have our tiered rate structure, we're penalizing the people who are decarbonizing their homes right now, right? You know, so we have to, this is the meatiest thing out there. And then what is solar worth on your home, right? If it's, if it's making your neighbor's fixed costs go up more, you know, and, and then you, you purchase the solar system thinking you're going to make money or, you know, recoup your costs over 20 years and the utility can, up your fixed um, fee next year, and they can up it again another year. So you, it never pans out for you. You have no financial certainty. So very unpopular questions because there's no easy good answers, but but really powerful. You know, if you get it right and you you do some smart things that save everybody money, um, and there are some things out there. You know, these are these are some of the really interesting interesting questions, and so. Um, Smart control panels are actually a really good answer to this, and we can talk talk more about that. So this is smart control panels. Um, essentially, the reason that we are having reliability problems in the summer in California is because we are an energy only market, and so they just they don't the dispatchability of that energy is not priced in to the wholesale market. It's in this other 
course market called resource adequacy. And it's never been an issue before because all the energy was flexible before where they just had gas speakers and they turned them on and off. And now we're faced with some big problems because essentially our market was not designed for the resources that are serving a lot of the load. So rather than, you know, traditionally you turn on your electric um, kettle or you know, hot water heater or whatever, and then and then the generation follows you, right? There's a big, there's a small morning peak and a big evening peak. And now one of the most promising things is to have through various devices, a smart circuit breaker and smart electrical panels being some of them to shape your demand around when there's surplus wind, when there's surplus solar. There's always surplus solar from 10 to four, you know, always surplus solar. So if you can have an electric heat pump water heater, preheat that, if you have a tightly sealed house, preheat your house with a heat pump space heater, charge your EV if you're home on the weekends, you know, anything you can do there, you can shape your home loads to match, you know, match the generation when it's available. That is going to be the cheapest way to decarbonize the grid. Otherwise, we have to build three times as many renewables in places people don't always want to build them, like protected areas, like farmland, you know, like things like that. Um, because if they're not flexible, you need a lot more of them because you need to just play the odds that something's going. Um, and then you have climate change on top of it, which is bad for hydroelectric in the West. Um, so, um, and this also smart circuit panels also have the benefit of if you are actually going to electrify everybody's home, you're going to double or triple the electrical load on the system. So then you have to have bigger wires and you have to have bigger transformers and you have to have, you need know, to upgrade the whole system. But it turns out most of the system is not used most of the time. It's, it's tremendously oversized if you can be smart and flatten out your demand. So these, so basically that's what a smart, um, smart panel does is, is it, it flattens your demand. You, you pre-designate which devices you want to make sure don't put you over your sort of uh, current limit, like your EV charger, and then it saves everybody money. We can talk more about it. Span.io is a good example. There are cheaper smart circuit breakers themselves. And then how should a natural gas utility be wound down? I know, you know, this is smart bits and watts here, but um, atoms matter too. <laughs> and uh, methane is just a very hard molecule to manufacture. It takes a lot of energy to get those four carbon bonds um, with hydrogen. So, you know, you can make methane in a lab or, or with green electricity. It's super, 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 super energy intensive. So that's why we're electrifying everything, right? You know, people have been trying, there's a little bit of renewable natural gas out there, sure, but you're gonna pay a big energetic price. So it's more efficient and cheaper to electrify everything. But if only the wealthiest people can afford to electrify their homes, the people that are left on the system will pay higher and higher costs to carry the fixed costs. And so again, you know, you don't want to be in the situation of climate versus equity. <laughs> you want to think about it smartly. If you if you prune a lot of the lines going out to single family homes, which are the least dense and kind of the least profitable from a utility perspective, prune those back saves everybody money. But do it, you know, a cul-de-sac at a time, a line at a time, especially if places are, um, especially if lines are, you know, due to be due to be replaced. And pg and &E and others are actually doing this. So, yeah, this is what I'm excited about. I've worked on a number of collaborations with RPE and PowerNet and AutoGrid. And, and I just have to say, after working in Alaska and American Samoa, we are so lucky here. We have a super mild climate and we are not on an island. And so this is really surmountable problems here, but it's more about being smart and figuring out how to share the money. Not that there isn't enough money to go around. You know.
Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of my talk in a nutshell. And I'll go to, I guess, the Q and A. Go back, and I'm going to go. The slide I want to hang out on is here because these are what I think are the most interesting things. Okay. <laughs> I was looking forward to talking about Huntington Beach. It's going to be great. All right. Oh, Craig, hi. Um, what are the biggest opportunities for college to get solar? Do I have anything in my grids? Um, you know, I think the biggest opportunities for Palo Alto to get solar driven community microgrids, um, I think starting within a premise. So all what that means is behind the meter, so you're not wheeling power along utility lines that you don't own as customers, right? So start at the premise. I would work with organizations that want emergency resiliency, like especially multifamily is very vulnerable in emergencies or disasters um, or um, shelters, you know, places that in, say, a big earthquake, you would want additional resiliency, which kind of valid, um, makes the cost worthwhile. Um, why not simply have incentives for dispatchable solar that pays time and delivery rates are higher? Yes, we don't have TOU rates in Palo Alto because we don't have smart meters yet because it didn't make sense um, financially. Sorry, oh, I was at Craig Lewis 150. Um, it's can you, still. Can you, can you read the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yes. There's some folks online. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I'll just finish. I'll keep going with the Craig Lewis 150. Why not simply have incentives for dispatchable solar that pays time of delivery rates with higher rewards when energy is most valuable to CPAU? Dispatchable solar is easily enabled with energy storage and TOD stratified rewards abide a straightforward matching principle. Um, yes, so the answer is yes. I think that will happen with the time of, you know, we could do it now with smart solar and storage systems, but we would have to we'd have to have an API with every single house or premise that had one of these systems and then we would have to compensate them at an agreed upon rate for every window of time and that is a lot of overhead on the utility side so by the time we price that in for our time to like make sure all the APIs are working with every single different brand of solar and storage um, there isn't very much profit left to give the solar and storage people a better, better return on their investment. And there's not much profit in the first place because solar and storage is still much, much more expensive than utility scale solar and storage because just the economies of scale. So it's, it's like doing a lot of work for pennies that kind of everyone would have to pay for because it's utility staff time. So, you know, it's, it's physically, it's not a bad thing at all. It's just, um, you know, and there, there are some interesting ways to slice that if you have larger installations in city, like something down at the airport parking lot or the research parking lot where you just have to have one API and validate when it's delivering. Okay, suppose I'm less of a believer in methane offset. What is the timeline approach to Yes, I'm so glad someone asked the offset question. Um, I don't believe in methane offsets. I think they're fine, <laughs> but I think Palo Alto can do better, especially because we're a natural gas utility. I think methane offsets are better used for something you do not exercise direct control over. Palo Alto exercises direct control over having a natural gas utility. So it's methane offsets are not counted in the 2020 update of the of the SCAP, and it means that we have to do a lot more work before 2030 um, and turn off gas from entire streets. You know, the CEC just hosted PG&E and SoCal, SoCal Gas um, yesterday, 
and said, it's really hard to get a whole bunch of neighbors to agree to cut off the gas lines. They said, you know, on a single street, maybe half the people will cut off their gas line. You know, you actually remove it, cap it. You don't want it leaking. Um, and then it'll be sort of the, then they'll start talking to their neighbors and then maybe the dominoes will start falling. So it's still going to be piecemeal in that respect, which is tough because the, the last is a game of musical chairs and the last one standing ends up paying the whole cost of the system. So you kind of, you need to do it, you know, it's we're, we're, we're basically planning if we go ahead with the goals, we're planning to kind of create almost our own death spiral on the natural gas utility where there's fewer and fewer customers to support the natural gas utility. And then it becomes more and more expensive over time for residential, not on commercial commercials on the, on the trunks. And so it's less, it's less expensive anyway. Yeah. So on that vein, as you draw down the natural gas is utility. There's a budget that the city of Palo Alto has for that, right? Is there a way to subsidize that as you go a little bit with that budget, knowing that eventually it's going to go away and that cost just disappears? Yeah, there are a lot of, it has to be done very carefully because there are so many constraints actually in the constitution of California via the proposition uh, mechanism in California. And I will just say everyone should read propositions really, really carefully because they are then once passed, they become part of the Constitution of California, and they are basically impossible to get rid of. They're not normal laws, and they, like, no other state has this system, and it's very, very dangerous. And so one of the things there is that Proposition, I think Prop 26, um, designates that we can only charge cost-based rates. And so if we're trying to look into the future, we have to be very careful that we're not overcharging right now, you know, that we're, you know, that we can defend that in court because it is litigated annually. So uh, by, you know, ratepayer advocates, like it's not a bad thing, but yeah, so it, the, the language is really strict. So, you know, wind down, yes. And the other thing is that different, different customer classes cost a different amount to serve. That's why commercial rates are cheaper than residential rates because it takes less pipe to get more gas there, right? So like single family, the, the natural, if we pruned all of the single family um, from the current natural gas system in Palo Alto, the utility would actually become more profitable because those are, you know, we're obligated to serve those or were had been obligated to serve those. And so because we're not a monopoly. And so we have to serve everyone, not just the, the profit, you know, more profitable ones. So, so, you know, things to think about. And there's just there's the single family solutions for electrification are just further along than, you know, industrial furnaces and like commercial cooking operations are just harder to electrify. Not impossible, but harder. Um, okay, how about combined financing for total upgrade property by property? Yes, financing is a great, answer to this you know it's it is hard i don't know if anyone's aware but um housing's expensive in this area <laughs> and so so when you talk about doing anything you're adding costs and that like becomes an equity thing in itself but financing is definitely one way to think about it um and it, and it makes it makes it a lot more tractable i think the analysis is that it's about, you know, to accomplish every, to basically accomplish the 80 by 30 goal in Palo Alto, it's $750 million. Um, and so that can be financed um, by individuals and by the utility, but it's a big number. And so, you know, and it's, utility has certain um, levers and, and not, and yeah, not every, you know, people need to step up and make their own decisions as well. Electricity rate. Problem with the lowest income areas, electricity rates are major concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Subsidy. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this is true. The one thing is that for, oh, sorry, I'm supposed to read it. <laughs> for all but the lowest income earners, are electricity rates really a major concern for customers? Unlike manufacturers and commercial establishments who pass on the overhead to customers, consumers isn't a few pennies on the way one way or another per kilowatt hour generally insignificant for most people subsidies can help the lowest income earners 
So, you know, this, this is a hard one. So we'll start with the subsidies bit. Um, public utilities have private utilities like PG&E are, are mandated by the CPUC to have a low income, lower rate. Public utilities have a code that they follow to do the same thing, an income qualified lower rate, but it's unclear if it's actually in conflict with the, you can only charge your costs of Prop 26. So it's, you know, and actually on the water side, we used to have a low income rate and it was challenged and it had to go away because it wasn't cost-based. Like if just because you make less money than that guy doesn't mean it costs less to serve you. So like that's the way that these, this fairness ends up being very regressive. And so, so that's a tough one. Um, it's there right now, but it might not survive a legal challenge. Um, and, you know, I think it's really tricky because for the lowest income earners, electricity, electri you know, energy, maybe not in our climate, but energy can be like 30% um, of their, their take home, you know, so it, that's the problem with energy in general is it has to be cheap, just like food has to be cheap because you can't live without it. So it's, it's not biotech, you can't make a million dollars every 15 minutes because it needs to be accessible. Um, so yeah, it's a tough one. Um, but, you know, I, I see your point, certainly in Palo Alto. Um, you know, although there's, you know, there's a lot of renters in Palo Alto. Okay. Yes, you're just one. Okay. For, more like comments. Yeah, yeah. About, so shall I read this one? Smart. Yes. Okay. About smart circuit breaker panel, turn off, Turn on off only provide discrete and continuous control of the loads. It's hard for me as a customer to want utility to turn off my home loads frequently. Did I not understand correctly what you meant by shaping loads by smart breakers? Can you explain challenges for utility to promote the smart breakers to customers like me? Yes. So glad you asked this question. So something that is really interesting. Tom Cabot's here too. Man. Um, something that is really interesting about smart, about smart circuit breakers is... Um, that first of all, there's a number of really great use cases. One is that a lot of homes have a 100 amp um, panel and the way an engineer goes in and sizes the panel, they take all of the loads at once and assume they're all gonna be on at once. And then they basically double it to make sure that you never, you know, nothing ever trips there. And so when you put an EV and an induction stove and then you pump water heater and you pump space heater on that sucker, all of a sudden you need 400 amps, especially if you have two EVs. And so, so that's not true. You don't have to run all of those at once. You wouldn't need to, and you wouldn't want to size the system for that anyway. So one of the really cool applications for a smart control panel is actually to go in as a sub panel downstream on the customer side. So the utility panel is still in place and the sub panel um, will trip uh, be before your utility panel. So you do not have to pay to upsize your service for full, which can get into the $30,000 to up upsize your service. Because if you trigger a knock on, we're like, now we need a higher transform and everything else, that, that falls back on you for the cost. So, so, and then you can prioritize which ones you want um, to trip first. Your EV charger is a great example of like um, something that is not going to be fussed if you if you um, you know have that as the first to kick off. Your hot water heater actually like can maintain 48 hours of hot water and it needs to be off for a couple hours. Great um, things like that. And if you just give it a little bit of play in your thermostat for your heat pump um, space heater, central or mini split, those are great too. So that's a really cool application. The other thing. Um, is that in the event of an emergency, if you gave the utility permission to throttle your whole panel, what you would be left is say you have a 100 amp panel and there's a major emergency and I say, okay, now you have a 75 amp panel because I need to know exactly what I'm dealing with. Um, 
you would have complete discretion within that 75 amp. It wouldn't be me going in and turning down your hot water heater or your Tesla or whatever else. So I think that's a pretty cool application as well. Um, yeah, it is, it is discrete, not continuous, um, but, you know, it's, you know, I'm familiar with weave grid and some other, you know, things for kind of, could it be yeah. linked with continuous application, it, like it's not EV charging at it, all? It could be, exactly. And I mean, it's, it's because they're so, because these things are sized so conservatively, you're really only dealing with this less than 10% of the time, you know, so it's really just a, so, yeah. yeah. Do you mind if I add one question yes. here, but yeah. smart meter? Yeah. So that was a big debate 10 or a dozen years ago. Yeah. Why does it come out with a smart meter? Now, yeah. Right? So, and after yeah. 10 years or dozen years, what is the city's perspective of smart meter? Everything yeah. Changed. Yeah, like no, 10 years ago, the solar and the wind has not this kind of opportunity or issues. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not. It wasn't actually, well, I mean, I wasn't at the city 10 years ago, but I in the report, um, it just didn't pencil out for Palo Alto because we have meter readers that go to each premise and read the electricity, natural gas, and water. So our meter readers were effectively one third the cost of, you know, as like Alameda has only power utility, right? So the cost savings, like it had to be one third the price that, that the smart meters needed to be one third the price to pencil out for us. And so it just didn't pencil out plus water, water meters are underground. So you need like really good radios to, to actually, otherwise you still have a meter reader and you didn't save any of the cost basically. Um, so um, yeah, and so, you know, it's happening and the rollout's like 2024 and luckily the price of smart meters has come way down and the back end and everything there is, I think so, you know, um, Especially you mean from a privacy perspective? It's also, see, you also, because so a big cost of the smart meter is communication, the network communication. Yeah. But the city also manages the fiber network. Yeah. That's a big leverage yeah. to reduce the cost. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, it doesn't go to all the right places, and it's limited. And there's a dark fiber loop and a not dark fiber loop. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely coming. It just didn't pencil out when we looked at it, and and now the prices are lower, and and people installed solar and got EVs anyway, right? You know, so it's it's disappointing as a researcher to not have that data, but you can also query the devices. Themselves, right. If we wanted to, you know, have go to the trouble of setting up the APIs with Tesla and Sunrun, then we can have most of the data we want anyway. Um, and like, yeah, I mean, there, we have had, we did have a pilot with, you know, watching people's, uh, you know, what, 150 or 300 homes had smart meters in them. So, you know, dealing with the different communications issues and the gateways. So now also. You know, the smart panel can also do the same function as media. I know, and it can do it by circuit breaker. By circuit so breaker, it can be like super granular. I know. I really want them. I want them in everywhere right now. But it's it's basically like 24 times the data though, so I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, more like surgical them. meter for the house. Yeah, exactly. But I know, I mean, it's so, you know. You can leapfrog yeah. to the it, next. Yeah, speaker. we could. We could, except, you know. <laughs> Uh, one one thing at a time, but but yeah, I mean, I think you know, generally the smart control panels are going in with solar and storage because the application is, hey, you know, when the big 9.0 earthquake comes, and I have my solar and storage system set up, I don't want to accidentally drain my Tesla power wall with my Tesla EV, <laughs> and there goes all my power to like you know power my house, assuming that. They don't get vehicle to grid, so they're rolling out with solar and storage. But it, you're right on all the all points. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, my head hurts to think what we would do with that amount of data. But but I mean, one really clear application is the low carbon fuel standard credits. They're trading at two hundred dollars a metric ton. Um, and if we can prove that our customers are charging with our clean energy. Um, um then you know then we can get we can recoup more of that money so it's just again it's just you have to have scale to make it worth my time 
Yeah, but all right. And then, yeah, Tom, Tom, good question. Uh, there is, you know, according to Professor Michael Wara, there is legal precedent for providing services, not fuels. So as long as we're providing energy, we can make the case that we don't, it doesn't have to be in the form of natural gas. It can be in the form of electricity. But the bigger thing, according to Michael Wara, oh, sorry, I didn't read the question out loud. Um, okay. So Tom says, can Palo Alto provide examples to the CPUC on how to define the obligation to serve to be the obligation to meet the end use needs, not to provide chemical energy? Yes, but Tom, you know we are not governed by the CPUC. We're we are a public entity, unlike PG&E, so we don't we're not strictly governed by them. But there is legal precedent, and what Michael Wara, Professor Michael Wara states is, you know, everybody used to have ferries going across the bay. And then they figured out the buses were cheaper and people were really mad that they didn't get their ferries anymore. But at the end of the day, the obligation was transportation, not a ferry, right? I think it's a pretty good analogy. And I'm going to put all of that legal interpretation on Mike Wara, not on myself at City of Palo Alto. Um, it's, you know, yet to be tested. But Mike, Mike Wara's other point is that community buy-in is actually so much more important neighborhood and community buy-in because if people are really angry about what you're doing it doesn't matter they'll still tie you up in the courts um all right debbie michaels it seems to me that we need to set a public goal for the city of palo to utilities that we will work with all residents and businesses to provide them an appropriate level of financial assistance to make the switch to electricity for their building okay we need to treat this change as part of our community effort we require that every house has a sewer, we require every building to be part of the water system, we require storm drains. Okay, even street trees are part of the city's responsibility. We need to frame the switch as being the city's responsibility we all collectively pay for and then work on how to do that in an equitable way with taxes or fees. Okay, um, switch for like, so this is all about electrifying natural gas appliances and I think that it's not a bad um, mat, bad idea. And I think on the resident, single family residential side and possibly multifamily residential side, you could probably make it financially work today um, where it's still gonna take money. So where the money is gonna come from is hard. And I think on the commercial side, things are less, less game ready. Um, but not impossible. Um, does anyone, does everyone understand that question? I feel like I'm talking to myself up here a lot. Does anyone, you know, <laughs> you know, they get what they're saying, like provide a, provide a subsidy to, to make this happen. Um, and I think, I think that the, where that money is coming from would probably require the community to vote um, and pass, you know, a bond, basically the same way you pass like a school bond. Um, uh, yeah. There's probably some confusion on how exactly that would work in reality. So if I own a home in Palo Alto and all of a sudden you say you're shutting my gas off, mm -hmm. that's it. And I'm like, okay, great. So now I got to hire an electrician and have them come in, put another circuit in for, uh, you know, 240, 220, 240 yeah, for an yeah. electric dryer. Like, that's all on me just because you decided to shut the gas off. I think that's... Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, like, I didn't decide it. Your elected officials decided it. <laughs> so, you know, but then maybe the whole council gets thrown out, right? I mean, I think that's, that's, the, that's the core point is that if we get ahead of the community on this, um, it's a big deal and there's real costs associated. And so, I mean, certainly, and, when the, and I will just say another really, really interesting thing is that um, I believe uh, Mike Wara, uh, I, won't, I won't put him under the bus again, but I did see some studies that um, there are, that voluntary versus mandatory means, so like incentives and getting the early adopters are actually just as fast you know, for basically the first five years um, because it takes just as fast for getting to a climate goal and like just as cost effective because um, 
because it takes a while. Um, yeah, and I don't know how is our time. It is two twenty-five. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the nightmare scenario, right? Where you just you just show up and somebody's ripping out your gas line. That's not going to happen, right? It's coming in stages. First, we've had voluntary piecemeal um, incentives, which are, hey, we'll give you fifteen hundred dollars to install a heat pump water heater, and you know, kind of comparable coming on the space heater side. And then there's all there's they already passed um, an electric only new construction, so you, you know, keep it out of the new construction, but very cost effective. Um, you know, and then maybe a gas ban. So right now you can have a line to your house, but just as long as you don't have any natural gas appliances when the inspector comes through, then it'll be, it'll pass inspection and then people could do other things. Um, and so then having an actual gas ban where you don't get a line to your house, like that, you no know, new lines. Because that, that's what costs us money, honestly, right? You know, in terms of, you know, if we're trying to save some costs by not spreading the system, like new lines are, are um, you know, one thing that's not uh, helping that equation. And then, and then I think really like the way PG&E has done it is they've found, they've found um, cities in the central, in the San Joaquin Valley that say, hey, we want to go all electric. You know, a lot of these cities are on propane and they don't have natural gas. And so pg &E could have an obligation to serve them, you know, depending on how dense and that kind of the agreements there. And so instead they get buy-in from the whole community and say, you know, we're going to, we're going to help you go all electric. Um, and then they become electric customers, you know, think about it. They're PG, from pg &E's perspective, that's load growth because they're not making any money from the propane sales, right? And then they don't have to extend this infrastructure that they're worried about winding down in the same way we're worried about winding our infrastructure down. So, you know, I think I think it's not, I think that, you know, point well taken. Um, yeah, and this, um, and then, you know, but for full context, Tom Cabot used to be in my job at City of Palo Alto five years ago. And now he's on like the sustainability, I'm gonna get the title wrong, Tom, but he is on like the board of advisors for Menlo Park City Council on their like sustainability team. And so really, really smart guy. Um, and, and what he's also familiar with is pg and &E is actually sharing their highly sensitive infrastructure gas line maps with you know, cities who want it, who can actually look at pruning the system back as they want. You know, they have the, the city has the relationship, city can go to a different neighborhood and say, hey, want to be all electric? You know, maybe it's better for all these reasons. Um, and so Tom has actually seen some of these maps and is actually like at that level. So um, jump ahead by P, all right, Palo Alto can jump ahead of pg &E by looking at 15 minute smart meter usage data to provide each customer with a monthly line item notice on their bill of how much remaining panel capacity the customer can use to electrify everything. Hmm. We don't have 15 minute smart meter data, but yes, I think that's true. You know, we could, you know, because we're not. You know, if the if if um, if the city and the community, being the voting residents, decide they want to go all electric, you know, we are not we are governed by them, unlike PG&E, which is governed by their shareholders, right? So we don't have a, nat a natural adversity to going to winding down our, our natural gas utility the way that PG&E does. Um, yeah. So let me ask another question regarding the. The secondary transformer. Do you see any issues even now? Because if I imagine you know, a lot of rich people in Palo Alto, if they plug in their electrical vehicle, you know, because a lot of people, even you don't have the dynamic rate, but uh, other people like to plug the EV, mm -hmm. have to go home, usually at night time, right? So they can get the car, have enough juice to drive in the morning. Yeah. Do you see any issue in, in the night time, the secondary transformer? Missy, because most of the second transformer like 600 amps, right? That's kind of the capacity. Yeah. But if you have 10 cars charging simultaneously, oh. Yeah, we're not seeing that, but we might be seeing um, 
faster wear and tear on the transformers, which is harder to find, right? Because, and the reason we're not seeing that is because our system is very conservatively built, very oversized already because we want a higher level of reliability and we, and because we don't want it, we're so small, we don't want to be rolling people all the time. And I mean, yeah, and <laughs> yeah, pg e is much less conservative on how many they support. You know, what's harder to see is if we're getting half the lifetime out of them that we expected, which would kind of speak to that if they're overloaded for a shorter period of time and, and everything else. The other thing that helps us is the climate and being so cool in the evenings, right? You know, if, if anybody wondered why a lot of Southern California was out with outages during like the rolling outages, it wasn't the rolling outages. Most of it was transformers exploding from the high heat when it didn't cool down at night. And like a lot, you know, anyway, LADWP isn't even in the Cal ISO and a lot of LA went out just from the transformers exploding. Because those warm nights stay on day heat. No bueno. Um, yeah, any other? Yeah. Um, so you talked a bit about the difference between uh, the public utility and pg e Could you like um, define some of the differences between a CCA and? Yeah, I, I mean, a CCA is, is just the um, supply and generation and sort of finance side of a public utility. So they deal with the electricity purchases out uh, outside of the um, outside of the entity, outside of the geographical entity, and then and that's it. And so they don't have to maintain the distribution wires, um, and yeah, and they don't have you know yeah. So that they're sort of they're the most profitable part of a public utility. Um, so, and I know that there are some, there's a lot of good work being done at CCAs, and I think they've put a lot of more renewables in ground than would be there otherwise. And now they're doing solicitations for long duration storage, which is really critical to increasing the amount of renewable generation on the system. So those are all really good things. There is, there is some concern on if they're sort of, they're sort of um, the cost that PG&E, you know, uh, the cost and debt that PG&E incurred in order to serve everyone are going to have to be repaid by someone. <laughs> and so by taking sort of the wealthiest groups off and taking the most profitable part of the business off, there could be some, some problems with equity. Um, caused by the CCA model. And that's that's kind of the CPUC's problem because they allowed the creation of CCAs. But I think I think they've done a lot of good things. And so I'm just, but that's what they are. They're just the procurement side and like playing in the energy and financial markets side. They're none of the dealing with the, the wires side and transformers blowing up and everything else. So it's interesting. It's my job basically. And, so I have a lot of friends who right there and considered it, been offered. But um, yeah, but why give up on the hard stuff? <laughs> what do you think about like utility scale battery storage? Yeah, um, it's coming. You know, I mean, it's here. There's a lot coming in the pipeline. Um, I think the prices are, you know, can be pretty good. Um, um, I personally have some reservations on like, what do you do with the batteries when they go dead? And I, I want to see better recycling or regeneration on that side, but, um, it solves a lot of the reliability problem, um, in California in particular, because we have sort of narrow peaks, um, if batteries are not going to get you to hundred percent renewable or even um, and I think the other thing that battery folks would say is that the market structure requires them to discharge their battery for four hours. And all the cost in a battery is in 
the size is in the energy, not in the, not in the rate. And so they're like, if all your need is an hour, let me discharge for an hour and I can have a smaller battery and make more money and help the grid more. So please, please, please revise the market. Um, so that's why actually some of the, some of the um, CCAs and some others are actually, you know, using in city or behind the meter batteries to use them in a more dynamic way. That's like more cost effective for everybody because the only way they'll be recognized in the, the energy system as an RA, RA resource, uh, RA eligible energy resource they can bid in is if they, you know, if they kind of derate their ability to discharge by, by, by 75%. So then they may, and then, you know, with the reliability issues, they've also been told how to dispatch the last summer and that was not in their best financial interest. So that's a, that's a hard place to be. All right, well, I can answer other questions, I guess, offline. I think we're pretty close to time or? Yeah, I can we're cool on time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the good questions.